Good morning. I, um, we have been anticipating this uh, public forum for some time. Uh, I'll, introduce the, I'll introduce the speakers in a moment. Uh, but this is our last event of the year. We've done a lot of uh, events on trade war, on women in politics more recently, uh, geopolitics, geoeconomics of the Mekong region, a number of events. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Frederick Naumann Stiftung, FNS, uh, the, uh, and Dr. Mary for uh, sponsoring our events, our public forums. Uh, you know, the support from FNS, the German Foundation, has enabled us to, to hold public forums and conferences uh, impartially uh, the way that we see, we see things, rather than uh, uh, under some certain pressure. So, uh, today we have a very uh, stimulating, I think, uh, and instructive uh, topic. And the topic is, it, it covers the, the universe. Uh, geopolitics, geoeconomics, digitalization, disruption, uh, but really mainly what we want to do is to, to take a comparative, a comparative approach. Uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Professor uh, Anna Lehmann, uh, who is professor at uh, UC of Porto in the School of Economics and Business, but uh, her distinction is that she has served in a government uh, cabinet capacity recently uh, for over a year uh, as the uh, Vice Minister for Industry. Uh, this is, uh, in Thailand we, we know a little bit of this, uh, you know, you can be a professor one day, a cabinet member tomorrow, and then you come back as a professor, but in Thailand sometimes they never come back. <laughs> They go and run parties, and they run the elections, and they lose themselves, and they get lost. Um, but in Thailand, uh, in, in Portugal, uh, it's great to see that you're back in, in academia. Um, well, during your time as a professor, and also as the uh, Vice Minister uh, of Industry, uh, Dr. Arner's key experience and key task was to promote uh, Portugal kind of 4.0. Now, when you talk about 4.0 in the Thai context, uh, it rings many bells. You know, we, we know a lot about 4.0. It's a, it's a household word. It's a household word. However, um, it's also a black box. We don't know what it is. Because the government, you know, with all their uh, propaganda and all their um, platforms, they're able to talk a lot about 4.0 without unpacking what this really means. The most concrete project we've had out of the 4.0 um, grand strategy, upgrading strategy, is to have this so-called Eastern Economic Corridor, Eastern Economic Corridor, which uh, is in the north, eastern provinces of uh, Cha Chang Sao, Rayong, and Chon uh, However, this is a uh, new, fairly new. It has uh, been promulgated into law only May this year. Had the government uh, implemented it sooner, you know, they've been in power four and a half years, we might have made some progress already. Uh, nevertheless, it's promising. This EEC, uh, the intention really is to uh, uh, build another Eastern, sea Eastern Seaboard. It's Eastern Seaboard 2.0. It will be the, the source of Thai economic growth for the next decade or two. Uh, they want to focus on s curve industries, a lot of infrastructure connectivity. They want to build rail, connecting the three main airports with the Pau, Don Mueang, and Suwanapum that you used when you landed. Um, and they want to uh, upgrade our port, um, and uh, so this would be Ma Lam uh, Lam Chabang, um, and also uh, you know the the airport uh, with the Pau. Uh, so basically, Thailand is like Portugal, and I think like many countries, they want to have a strategy for growth. They want to have kind of an industrial policy, if you will, where the state, the government, uh, plays a leading role in organizing, in cultivating um, growth strategies and projects. So today, you have uh, the bios of the speakers, so I'm not going to go into a long introduction. Uh, I'll introduce one by one, but uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Professor Anna Lehman. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, Professor of uh, Economics Business, uh, Vice Minister Industry, uh, but she also has worked on innovation. Uh, she has been a consultant. Uh, so, you know, she straddles not just academia and business and government, but even beyond, even beyond. Uh, so perhaps uh, you have, I know you have a presentation that you would like to leave with us, you would like to show us. Um, you have up to uh, 30 minutes and then after that I'll try to tease out some of the key points from the Thai and Southeast Asia context. Uh, Professor Anna.
Good morning. First of all, I would like to say it's a privilege to be here today and an honor and a pleasure. I would like to ask Dr. Titinan Pongsudirak, Director of ISIS Thailand, the opportunity to be here in such a prestigious center that is a reference not only in Thailand and in Asia, but all over the world. And also, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, specifically also such a prestigious also opinion leader in the areas in which you specialize. I'd like to greet all the other participants, a very special uh, greeting to Dr. Pavida Pananon, whom I know I'm not going to say for how many years, because we were in kindergarten, more or less, that we've uh, been colleagues in the PhD uh, back in England, uh, and is also a reference in international business. I would like to greet the other speakers as well. It's very important for me also to have the chance of debating these issues with you. A very special reference to His Excellency, our Ambassador, Ambassador of Portugal, Francisco Vaz uh, who is really uh, taking the prestige in the name of Portugal to the highest level here in Thailand. Uh, it's such a pleasure also to be here today. Thank you for coming. His Excellency, the Ambassador of New Zealand as well, Dr. Kevin Cottrell, also our Economic Counselor from Portugal. And I would like to greet uh, each and every one of you. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. So I I'd like to share with you a few ideas on such a rich topic, uh, the rich topic of our seminar. And it's really, the, the, what I want to do is really, like I said, to share some ideas because the issue is so rich that I think we can then, uh, with the other speakers and in the debate, uh, discuss the nuances that you find the most interesting. So, um, in, I'll propose a brief agenda. First of all, I will take an economic an angle on uh, digitalization and disruption, focusing on my area of specialization on international business. Um, and I will make some, well, some statements on uh, some implications I think it may have challenging traditional models of internationalization, but also on democratizing internationalization because the digital uh, technologies can be seen as powerful tools to make internationalization available to smaller and more peripheral players. I will make a brief reference to the platform economy that is also changing a lot the way supply and demand meets. Uh, and I will also argue that these dynamics and digitalization in particular is really questioning the heart of the concept of markets as we know them uh, and also eventually disrupting and when i say disrupting I, I don't have any negative charge on the it's challenging is making it different so even in value chains that i'm sure is a topic that professor pananon will take later on as she's a, a very important specialist on this uh, finishing the economic part I will delve on some policy implications and then I will go into a second part of my presentation. Because of course, although for me it's easier to speak from an economic standpoint because that's my area, but in due fairness, the digitalization impact and as in the topic of the seminar, it is uh, you know, well patent. The impact of digitalization goes well beyond the economic realm, having a huge impact also in terms of our society, of politics, of policy making in other dimensions. So I will make a few considerations on digital in its interface with geopolitics and then um, talk a little bit about Europe, Portugal, and as I know and I've been uh, eagerly reading about uh, Thailand also, uh, draw some common points, but I would leave uh, the um, Thai part more to the other speakers, although I think we can discuss together because we have some really common interests that I think are worth highlighting. So having said that, starting with an economic angle, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about this interface between digital transformation and international business, because as we all know, digital transformation is affecting business and international business in particular. One thing that uh, is really a characteristic of digitalization is that it is borderless, uh, is that it is limitless in its territorial expansion, so international business is really a privileged context for, for this analysis. 
And the, the impact is so uh, varied and multidimensional because it impacts each company, it impacts whole sectors, and it impacts markets at large. There's a very uh, important set of impacts that come from the supply side, and this is usually the most highlighted aspect, technological disruption in particular. So coming from the technological part and seeing what are the changes that it causes in terms of supply, in terms of the companies. However, uh, for me, it's as important, and maybe in some cases even more important, the impact it's having on the demand side that very often is not so much highlighted. The digitalization brings a new consumer to the fore, and this new consumer is much more than the traditional one. It's a very proactive uh, type of individual. <clears throat> It's a bit uh, an individual in terms of a person or even uh, a business because businesses can be consumers too. So they call it uh, him or her prosumer because it's like sometimes a bit of a producer and a consumer. So the new consumer wants individuality, wants to feel special, wants products that are customized to him or to her, wants to be also a co-producer a co-creator, sometimes a co-designer, and sometimes even participating in the distribution process. So this new uh, consumer is a multifaceted uh, person and demands very high uh, standards also from the companies. And this is all being enabled by digitalization. Digitalization itself is disrupting old business models and bringing about new ones, and I'll speak a little bit in terms of international business, uh, in the way that it is impacting on the very processes of internationalization of companies. Uh, I will argue that it, it brings about a different balance between the traditional modes of entering foreign markets and even changing as I said before, the very concept of market and deterritorializing it. Uh, and uh, as I said, my second part will um, will really analyze more in the ways in which it goes well beyond the economy and into social uh, social dimension and geopolitical level. Uh, digital transformation is here to stay, and is way more than a buzzword. Sometimes it is used like that, but. Uh, it's way more than that. It's really an ongoing process of deep change. Uh, sometimes, and I'm a passionate for economic history and for history in general, and sometimes I really, when I think about it, and now everyone is speaking about revolutions, the fourth industrial revolution, the fourth dot zero, etc. And it's true that is uh, an expression that gathered the uh, important dimension, but I have doubts that the transition from the third to the fourth industrial revolution is more transformative than the change from an agricultural society to the first industrial revolution. I will, my bet would be that the transition from an agricultural society to the first industrial revolution was even more profound. However, what I think uh, no one has doubt is that the current change Current transition is happening at a pace that is totally unprecedented. Uh, there was a futurist called Gary Vaynerchuk that says we live in a VUCA world. VUCA means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it's really the current context. The pace is so fast. And uh, are governments going to be able to keep pace with all this, and even companies? That's what I have some doubts, but I'm still an optimist person. Uh, digital transformation, it's important to understand it and its impacts, both on economics and on geopolitics, to sort of unbundle it. It has a sort of breakdown into some parts to analyze them better. So it has a tangible part, without any doubt, of physical infrastructure, of hardware, uh, the 4.0 issues, robotic automation, etc. But it has a very important, uh, and I would say even more important, intangible dimensions. Also, infrastructure has a very important intangible part, networks, and very often it's the networks, it's the internet of things that makes a difference, not just the hardware, but also in terms of the skills. 
And in my opinion, the qualification of human resources is really probably the most important aspect of any policy of 4.2. The other thing that is so important if we want really to assess the impact of digital transformation is to understand that it really implies a multiplicity of stakeholders and also a multiplicity of contexts and environments. Uh, first of all, the citizen, and of course this doesn't have any order of importance, but uh, the citizens. Citizens have multiple roles, the so-called new consumer up to the voter. Because the citizens are everywhere in so many different capacities. The users of technology, etc., etc. So digitalization goes well beyond the factories. It enters in the government, in terms of the processes in which government relates to citizens. It enters in democracy. It enters in the way that we relate to each other, that we relate to our families, etc. Companies, government, the territorial aspect, cities being a major player, the work environment, uh, digital is really impacting on the, the layout of companies on the way, even at universities that we teach, etc. In politics, in the media, a panoply of other public and private organizations, including NGOs and the third sector, not just purely public or private. And for me, really, all right, being an uh, imminently technological phenomenon, the human and social dimension are at least as important than the technological one. Technology will always be developed, but the absorptive capacity of people is what will make a difference. And also, the impact at social level is something that no policymaker can ignore. Digital transformation has been brought about by different catalyzers or drivers. The reduction of the price of new technology is really very impressive and this created new ways to apply technologies and democratizing also their use to different actors. And we live in an increasingly connected world. It's really incredible because the number of connected devices uh, until 2030, it is estimated to grow 125 times. And the, I would say, I would highlight as a key aspect that nowadays no one innovates alone. So it's very rare that a company of the future, for example, or even a government of the future, will be known for betting on one technology. Even if you consider a certain business enterprise, now to do something, you need to use so many technologies at once. So it's this complexity and convergence of technologies that is a defining feature of digitalization. Very seldom now you will have a company excelling only in the use of one technology. And when you use, for example, mobile, cloud sensors, IoT, you have to use it uh, in a convergence. And this brings new challenges. Also the advent of new and unexpected actors that bring new services, new ways of relating supply and demand, and especially that give more power and voice to the side of the consumer that is very demanding and wants instantaneous feedback. And this new consumer, I would say, is a foremost driver of change. And digital is everywhere because it impacts on the consumer and then the consumer impacts on the way production is organized. And then the, product, the way production is organized and the way goods and services are distributed impact also and give feedback to the consumer. It's very fascinating. So, when talking about new and unexpected actors, we really have to mention uh, the platform economy that nowadays is driving the way uh, that uh, business is organized. Uh, it's very interesting that the main owner of media in the world is Facebook. That does not create any content. Content is supplied by the people that participate. It's very interesting. The other day I was checking a ranking uh, if, if uh, companies and countries were put into one single ranking, that the biggest country, in country, not in the sense of the nation state, of course, but if it would be a group of citizens, would not be China, would be Facebook. And you know, if you take the top 10, half would be countries, half would be companies. Like the biggest transportation company in the world, Uber, does not own a single vehicle. Uh, for example, the main supplier of rooms and accommodation in the world does not own any hotel. 
Uh, and the biggest retailer in the world, the Ultimate Platform, does not have any physical store. Up to now, because, and this is important for our discussion on value chains, it will buy some. So we, will, we are seeing also some movements on the opposite side in new ways. So, but this is the world as we live it. And if you look in five years only, the top five publicly traded companies in terms of market cap, look today, they are all digital companies and platform companies. Some supply also hardware, it's interesting. Hardware and software, that is actually the software that makes the difference. You know, uh, what would be Apple if it wasn't uh, iOS software? The software is far more important than the hardware. The same for Microsoft, for example, etc. Alphabet, the owner of Google, Amazon, Tencent, the very important Chinese company as well. So this is now uh, the, what has changed in the last few years. And uh, non-traditional companies replacing traditional business models and the platform economy and digital really conspicuously appearing at the top. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, read uh, the numbers, but the, the pace is really unprecedented. To reach 50 million users, airlines took uh, over 60 years, 68 if I remember, automobiles, 62 years, uh, telephone uh, 50, uh, etc. So uh, a simple digital game, Pokemon Go, took 19 days. So this is a sign of the times indeed. This is a sign of the times and makes us reflect. Now, funneling a bit towards internationalization and the international business, the traditional model, that is still the predominant one, by the way, I'm not saying, you know, uh, I'm a very moderate person, so I, I try not to admit that the new dynamics are just uh, with a magical wand replacing the, the old models. And when I say old models, I say also current models. The main uh, share of the companies still internationalize in a stage basis model, like what we call the Uppsala model, starting by being domestic without exporting slowly starting to export and experiment if then establishing eventually and that's what is being challenged at the moment establishing sales subsidiaries because the platform economy is putting this into question and if they are industrial eventually going deep into production or manufacturing so this is the traditional model that still is the most prevalent one however nowadays and in particular with the opportunities brought by digital uh, born globals or companies that are very small are already born with a global mindset, with an inter immediately wanting to sell to international markets. And this is such a different business model. It's not gradual, it's not process based. It's really being open to the world from the very uh, first day. We also call them international new ventures. So these non process models, more immediate, models like one globals are really being more and more important but they still are a minority uh, something that i find very interesting when i reflected on this a few years ago i developed uh, a seminar that was called low cost internationalization and this was quite interesting to think about it because digital technologies allow undoubtedly to internationalize using fewer resources Nowadays, and I know a few cases like this, a couple of individuals, and even only one sometimes, can have a platform, and this can be very, not so costly, can be a hundred dollars to, to have one, and have a window to the world through digital. And this is so empowering, and so uh, it changes a lot. For example, I, I knew a founder of a startup also from Porto, and he, he went to Chile in a program of Startup Chile, and now it's a software, they, they have a software for uh, electronic commerce. So now this company supplies 60% of the stores in Chile and several all over the world. And you can customize your website, it starts like $200, uh, uh, $300. And it's so incredible because before to sell your products, you need to have an agent or to have um, a store. 
And this is so costly. A minority of companies could afford this. And now you can sell all over the world uh, with very few resources. I'm not saying it's easy because e-commerce models also can be very tricky. Uh, it can be very tricky and I, I have lots of discussions with business people on this. For example, it brings a lot of unpredictability because after a certain size you need really to, you have the, you know, the goods coming back, etc. So I'm not saying it's easy, but it really democratizes internationalization because you don't need, in some cases, to invest in commercial subsidiaries. Also in terms of value chain, nowadays everyone uses platforms, even governments for public tenders. The smallest the tender of a government now uses platforms. So all the actors use platforms. So you contract now via platforms across the value chain and not only on the private side. The other thing is, uh, in terms of the factories, this will bring uh, also uh, the prevalence of a new type of factory. Not necessarily, I'm not saying the large ones will disappear, but what I'm saying is that there will be a concomitant uh, trend of having smaller factories, more near the consumer, for example, using technologies also digital, like 3D printing and others. So, in short, this will uh, bring a coexistence of different internationalization models, and I'm saying something that can be a bit controversial, but I believe that this will bring a decrease in the relevance of foreign direct investment, especially in the commercial side. In terms of production, we don't know. There will be still big factories, but also smaller ones, more near the consumer, and more subcontracting, more near the final consumer. So most probably, uh, foreign direct investment will will decrease in relevance in many ways. Uh, and several of these born global models are based on exports. Are based on exports, but you know there will still be international networks for sure, and the traditional models. But this will change a bit with this, and contractual forms will be very important. And the way this interacts with value chains is really fascinating. Uh, something that is totally, um, I think it's something that no one can deny, is that there will be an increase in collaboration on alliances and networks, because nowadays uh, no one really innovates or can innovate alone in this complex world of digital. Uh, Low-cost internationalization, in short, opens important opportunities for small and medium enterprises, for startups, and for companies in emerging markets and in peripheral areas that otherwise could not probably have the resources. So as you see, I am seeing this in a very hopeful way, in a very positive way, not denying, of course, the difficulties, the adaptation challenges, etc. Another thing that is important, open innovation. Like no one innovates alone, it's so important that large corporates also, and this is also a trend, that use more and more the more maverick type of startups also that don't have the same administrative heritage or legacy that the large corporates have to perform more radical types of innovation. But I have to say that I'm not convinced that this is so unilateral. I think that startups have a lot to gain and learn from the large corporates because it's very fashionable to speak about startups, and rightly so. However, they have a lot to learn in terms of conducting their business models, in terms also they have a lot to gain in terms of getting a client that makes them viable. So this, as, as Professor Titinan said, I have a responsibility in government recently, and I was in charge of all industrial sectors of Industry 4.0 and of the startup ecosystem. But for me, the most important thing was to bring them together, create synergies. In terms of value chains, I leave an idea here because this is very rich, I don't have time to address, but there's this issue of disintermediation and fragmentation. Or maybe not. When I say maybe not, is I see that one of the world leaders. Uh, in distribution of uh, um, luxury goods, Farfetch, that is a Portuguese founder, but the company is based in the UK, in London. Farfetch, that you may know is uh, Farfetch and NetApporte are the two biggest platforms in luxury. So, now Farfetch bought Browns, it's a big department store in London. Amazon is going to buy stores. Uh, a startup that I know that is in footwear in Portugal called Andandi, 
the, the founder tells me, I, I sell to 140 countries and I never left Lisbon. It's not even in any of the production centers. It's in the capital of Portugal and is selling just via a platform to 140. But he told me, I'm going to integrate vertically and buy the factory. So at the end of the day, we are seeing also some forces in the opposite way, starting not so. And what we, I think we should also take into account that this is a great opportunity to improve the competitiveness of businesses through efficiency and the productive uh, productivity aspect of it across the value chain and reducing internationalization costs. I'm not going to characterize this, but in terms of uh, a market that is very interesting is the platforms that sell apps, applications for mobile devices. This is such a huge and vast market. It's bigger than the GDP of several countries. And I have some examples of platforms there, App Store, Google Play. Google Play now is the first it used to be App Store, although App Store is still sort of the benchmark. You know, this is, this is a market. This is a market that is bigger than several markets of several countries. And so we need to think more uh, when, we inter when we are an uh, internationalization promoting agency, when we are a government, what kind of markets are we considering? What kind of strategy do we have to advise our companies? Because being just territorial and country-based is not enough in a platform economy, is not at all enough. So this is really questioning the heart and the core of what we understand to be a market. Because it's true that a territorial dimension is still relevant. However, many markets nowadays are not at all territorial. Global value chains, if I am a company selling olive oil from Portugal or a company selling a certain type of wood from Thailand, am I going to approach the US market? Or am I going to approach, for example, the global value chain of Walmart? or a, a Whole Foods a supermarket. Isn't it much more important to enter in a value chain rather than trying to have a distribution scheme for a country with the resources and risk it implies? The other thing that um, is very interesting, there's now a huge uh, opportunity because the platform economy entered on multilateral institutions like the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, etc public tenders, for example, to, to provide equipment for schools. Imagine in a country, in, in one of the region, uh, the countries in the region. So then the, the producers of uh, furniture or textiles can apply just being in front of a computer. And this is so interesting. And digital platforms, my former slide, all these apps, the Amazon, Zalando, the PlayStation, all these, these are markets. So we need to rethink what we understand by a market. So, uh, moving uh, fast and forward now, it's really important that to understand that digital is an enabler. Uh, it's very interesting to understand it in its impact that it has on all sectors, not only in manufacturing, but also in services. It's disrupting the banking business with fintech, techno the technological companies related to finance. Agriculture, precision agriculture, for me, is one of the most fascinating uh, examples. Uh, so I tr one of my last things was to promote a digital innovation hub in precision agriculture. Blockchain, for example, is now using to trace every type of good. For example, in terms of fisheries, I've given an award to a startup that was using blockchain to do the traceability of, of the fish. This is so important because new consumer wants to know almost who fished my fish, if you allow me the expression. So the other and the last idea that I'll leave in this vein was that digital really to be effective and to in order to seize the opportunities brought by digital technologies to internationalization, we cannot think only after the goods or services are produced and the, and the, the distribution phase. We need to understand all the process. Digital has to contaminate all the value chain and indeed is doing so. So from R&D to design, it's getting all digital up to the after sales service. And it's so important to have this holistic and systemic view of digitization because if we concentrate only on bringing it 
to the platforms or to the foreign markets, we are missing a big point. So it's not just about production, it's not just about sales. It's all the value chain and a 360 degrees concept. So to finish this part, and the second part will be much shorter, but to finish this part, the policy implications also when we look at the, what can governments do. These implications are so multidimensional and even if we are working on internationalization, we cannot just look on policies related to that. For example, Professor Padanon and I go all over the world giving seminars and panels on outward uh, internationalization policy. But now, is it really the main type of policy? Because I would argue that more and more horizontal policies should be the most critical ones, not forgetting, of course, some outward or inward FDI policies. But horizontal policies, what are they? Qualification of human resources is the crucial type. Innovation and ecosystem promoting policies. And in some cases, infrastructure policies, but infrastructure policies in a rich way, especially on the intangible side. And this includes data. None of this that we are talking about, about digital, is really um, applicable if there are no good data. When we talk about artificial intelligence, about blockchain, about cybersecurity, etc., this is meaningless without high quality data. And I would say this is a big challenge for many countries, uh, many countries, because the data infrastructure does not have very often the requisite quality to use up the potential of digital technologies. So, in short, horizontal policies, human resources qualification, one, ecosystem and innovation, two, and I would say infrastructure privileging the data uh, aspect. Implications, of course, lots of implications for a policy maker. What is the future of work? No one knows what will be the future of work in 10 years, but I tend to think about the digital as being a way of augmenting human talent. Of course, there will be displacement, displacement, I wouldn't say of jobs. It's much more important to consider displacement of tasks. Every job has dozens of tasks associated. Some will be easy to automatize, some not. For example, even as academics, if you think, some of our tasks can be automatized, but some not really. There's, there's, there are some aspects of the human mind and interaction that are not at all easy to automatize. Uh, and it is full of unknowns. What we know is that the upskilling and especially the reskilling effort of those that are already in the work environment is really critical. But digitization is here to stay and sh I believe it should be promoted in a, in a holistic and ecosystem based type of uh, approach, uh, including several aspects like even public procurement to promote ecosystem is very important to help the emerging technologies, venture capital, basic research funding. It's interesting because this is bringing a lot, basic research. And nowadays everyone talks about the future of work and soft skills, but I tell you the most important uh, skills at the moment are very hard skills, data analysts, AI, uh, artificial intelligence scientists, etc. So basic research is getting a prominence again. Alliances and collaboration, a feature of the present and of the future, and promoting this convergence of technology and uh, key enabling technologies. For example, relate artificial intelligence is something that is really important. It's nothing new, it's there from the 50s but the ways in which it, it is applied are really very important. For example, climate change, agriculture, etc. Now, to finish my presentation, uh, and I'll, even though I'm an economist, I wouldn't like to be just confined to that dismal science, and it's really important to acknowledge how it transcends the economy. Digitalization does not happen in a void. It has such a huge impact, as we saw in so many examples, on democracy elections, on the spread of social and political movements, for the good or for the not so good, for the not so good. For example, I met uh, was, uh, 
in 2017, a guy called Brad Parsky. I met this guy at the Web Summit that I used to organize the Portuguese part of this. It's a big conference with 70,000 people. Brad Parscale was the leader of the social network campaigns of Donald Trump. It's, I had an incredible conversation with him. And it's widely acknowledged that without Brad Parscale, Trump probably wouldn't have been elected. The Arab Spring, the Green Revolution in Iran, the way serious movements uh, have shown the world what was going on. All this was based on digital. Fake news, recruitment of terrorism. This, you know, is the worst part of it, but there are also very good things. It gives voice to the stakeholders, exercise of free speech, etc. So an array of important impacts. Cybersecurity is a key aspect. One of the things I've done in the recent past was to set a group on cybersecurity. Very important. Uh, governance is the key question. How are we going to promote the governance of all this? I don't have an answer, but it's really going to be a complex affair because is government be a leader? Will be a leader of this because government is so far behind in some aspects, or is going to be a follower? And there's a conflict between the long term and political side. So here, I think government is not enough for sure. Finally, digital and geopolitical. Finally, but of course last, but not the least, because this is even richer than the economy, although I'm going to be fast here. Uh, these unprecedented change and opportunities are changing also the balance between traditional uh, economies and emerging economies. Uh, emerging economies are really leapfrogging very fast. They are faster and more open to risk. And the digital brings new sources of competitive advantage. And the good thing is that it can be creative, unlike natural resources. And also, um, I've been reading about some very fascinating report based in Italy on geopolitics of digital. And it's so important to consider this uh, interface between human, institutional, and economic players, creating new spaces. Digital is creating a new sense of space, a new sense of time. And the thing is, and I, I leave this for our reflection, in terms of the, who is the owner of the new and critical infrastructure that embodies all this? Because, for example, fiber optic cables, there are 1.2 million kilometers that are making this data circulate among all of us. And the major owners of this are companies. Companies also that own the hyperscale data centers. 2% of the emissions of CO2 relate to 400 data centers in the world. The US has 44% of these data centers, then of course China, but only with 8%. So, who owns the data? Who owns the infrastructure? You can see that how weak are nation states and governments in this. And this uh, platform economy brings also an extraterritoriality. And now, what is the unit of analysis? I'm not arguing, arguing that nation states are not relevant. Of course, they are relevant. But what I'm arguing is that we have new and emerging players that in some cases control much more. Uh, and they also they bring together a new characterization of existing networks. For example, I'll highlight the importance of satellite networks for everything from agriculture to security and sovereignty. Of course, this brings regulatory and security challenges at the national, subnational, and multinational levels. How to establish an agreement on a broad-based uh, regulatory level playing field for all this? and even one that is capable anticipate, of anticipating fu future developments. This is not easy. And again, traditional geopolitics has to be sort of reconceptualized because states maintain centrality of action and control of executive power and several strategic resources. But as I uh, gave uh, an example on the oceanic data connectors and internet connectors, they don't own several of the critical infrastructure that is really, that can shut off the world basically. It's very important to understand that the digital domain brings a lot of power to non-state, non-traditional players and how to govern all this, how to create a playing field for this. And also new threats of strategic nature. 
and uh, to finalize, digital brings a new type of space. Like in geoeconomics, it brings a new concept of markets. To finish, and I think I would leave this more to the discussion, Europe. Europe is at a, uh, it's, it's really with uh, major, major challenges because none of the 10 largest digital players is European. Uh, US and China control uh, this. Uh, in artificial intelligence, Europe is lagging behind US and China. I used to be the representative of Portugal in the ministerial conferences on artificial intelligence. And even Europe, they were saying, next month we'll have a strategy. It's really a cause for concern for me. Who are the countries that lead? Number one is France. France has a very interesting um, strategy on artificial intelligence that was proposed uh, a few months ago. Second is Finland. But lots of, m some of the main European countries are far, far behind. There are very important initiatives on cybersecurity. Europe is lagging behind in terms of venture capital. So Europe has to find its way in this new world. Also, I would say the same for Thailand, because with such a powerful neighbor, for example, like China, what is then the place of uh, important countries like Thailand in all this uh, worldwide chess? Uh, there are so many challenges. So many challenges, for example, in terms of Europe, fragmentation, bureaucratic superstructure. I, was, I made a big wake-up call in this ministerial conference that I was there in October. They were only talking about ethics, very important aspect, of course, ethics on artificial intelligence. But I say, you know, poor of us, if we start the discussion by ethics and forget the opportunity. Of course, we need to manage the ethical side, etc. But, you know, you see, the, the Americans and the Chinese very well so are discussing the opportunity and then managing all the challenges. And in Europe, we are starting the discussion by the ethics. Then we won't have much future, I think, if we if we focus not on the opportunity. And uh, but still, Europe has some very strong points: industry 4.0, research, value-added manufacturing. So these are the ideas. And I think in Thailand, you in, between Thailand and Europe, uh, I think in the debate then we can address that. But there are very very important common. Uh, interests and you've been giving an importance to digital. Uh, it's very interesting to say that from a public and private, uh, both from a public and private uh, type of approach, you've been. You even have a minister for digital in Portugal. We are not even there. We are not even there. Thank you.